So this brings me back to feedback. Um, this time, my physics lecturer. Uh, at the end of my first year, I scraped into the exam with a 40% class mark, and I ended up writing a supplementary exam. And on the evening after we wrote the exam, I received a phone call from my physics lecturer, and he said to me, Besaidna, what is wrong with you? Now that it doesn't matter, you get 93%. If you decide not to study medicine, come and see me immediately. He didn't have to phone me. I mean, who does that? <laughs> and he phoned, I, he phoned during Dallas, you know? <laughs> But the fact that he did phone me changed me forever. And feedback is clearly an essential element of any educational process. It enables good habits to be reinforced and flawed ones to be corrected. How should we give feedback? <coughs> All I'm going to say about this at this stage is that it is very important to establish a respectful learning environment. You cannot expect your students to accept feedback if there is not respect between the two of you in the way that you communicate as well. So feedback should also always be based on direct observation and not something that you've heard from somebody who heard it from somebody. So there are things that are very important. And once you've done the feedback, it's very important to also have an action plan. So what are we going to do now? And then reflect on your feedback skills. The fact that you are giving feedback don't mean, doesn't mean that you are perfect and create and attend staff development opportunities so that we can make feedback an institutional culture. Now, who remembers the brachial plexus? It seems that Stefan's does. Remember for the medics, for anybody who did a section, Remember that first day with a scalpel in your hand, hovering over the skin in trepidation that you are going to destroy the brachial plexus even before you know that you've cut through it. Only to a few days later embarrassingly realize that it is virtually impossible to miss the brachial plexus because each of the nerves are as thick as my pinky. Um, through all of this, we had Dr. Marie. She had the grace not to laugh in our faces, but to gently guide us to discover all the truths of the body. And I developed such a love for anatomy that I again turned tutor. And Herman, my dear friend to this day, in Canada at the moment, still acknowledges my tutoring as the only reason he passed anatomy. Dr. Marie, a role model and a mentor to honor and remember. Teaching, I believe, is at the heart of the future of our professions. And an important part of teaching is our role models. Those individuals we admire for their ways of being and acting as professionals. And I think it's not only a privilege to be a role model, but an obligation. I've already introduced you to some of my role models, and you will still meet a few more. But there are some that I won't introduce to you because I will not have time to do justice to all of them. But I've literally danced with some of them. And with all of them, I've engaged in the dance of learning. Role, model, 
role modeling is central in our experience of learning how to become and be. And therefore, it can be said that it's a, at the heart of professional character formation. So it is of great concern that students only consider about 50% of their teachers as uh, positive role models. And students and junior doctors identify with role models when it influences their choice of career. So those two events often coincide. So having only 50% positive role models limits their career choice. One fine morning I woke up and I realized I too was a role model. And it was a very scary thought. I had to reevaluate myself and my being, and I started to learn more about learning from role models. And this process has been described very elegantly by Ronald Epstein. And he says that the first thing you do is observe the role model. And then there are things that happen subconsciously. When you observe your role model, unconscious e incorporation of the ob observed behavior happens. And at the same time, you explore the effect and the values of the role model and the impact it has on you. But then also, you try to make the unconscious conscious. And you engage in a process of reflect a reflection and abstraction that you then try to translate into insights. And these insights then become principles and actions that results in behavioral change, influenced by your role model. So there's an unconscious and a conscious process, and we need to be aware of that. So we have responsibilities as role models. And I want to say only that we should recognize the importance of role modeling and always be sure that we make the implicit explicit so that our students can understand why we do it the way we do. And again, as in feedback, because the two go hand in hand, we need to relate our actions to future actions, and again participate in staff development, not only for the opportunity to acquire skills, but also to role model the desire to improve ourselves. How can we expect our students to do that if we, if we don't do that? My dance partner, of course, pathology. In the second semester of my second year, Prof. Ian Simpson walked into the classroom at Tuckies and he started lecturing anatomical pathology and he talked about nomenclature. So, definitions. Now, that is pretty boring at the best of times. I walked out of that lecture and I said to Herman, this is what I want to do. And a few days later, Professor Leonora Dreyer gave a lecture, and I was hooked for life. And this, to me, is the power of role models. It was not so much the subject at th that stage. It was the people who stood in front of the room. And at the end of my third year, things didn't look so good. I had such a good time that I had to repeat my third year. And three months into my repeat here, I decided that I did not want to continue with medicine. I was restless and I feel, felt that medicine wasn't for me, despite my love for pathology. And my dance partner and I were falling over each other's feet. Obviously, I returned. And I will not bore you with the intervening years, but suffice it to say that if I leave those two years that I went away, provided me with life experience that stood me in good stead. And I have never regretted that interruption. 
Of course, going back two years later meant that I met my future husband in class. And the rest of our student career was very uneventful. We, was, we were a small group who did all our clinical rotations together. And we spent, those times you still did clinical rotations in the mornings and lectures in the afternoons. So we spent many an afternoon in the Pretoria Zoo. <laughs> <laughs> Discussing cases, studying, even reading journal articles, um, rather than attending those boring lectures. You might recognize this from the song, The Rose. Um, I want to pause here for a brief moment and acknowledge the lives of three of the members of that small group. My friends, Gabi Krenzer, who died of uncontrolled diabetes at 32. My friend, Norval Elwood, who was killed in a carjacking a few years after he qualified as a psychiatrist and my late husband, Francois Hugo. Now we are moving towards life at Tigerberg. And I decided not to mention any of the role models and mentors that could be in the audience, even though I'm very tempted, because I'm bound to forget somebody and then I will forever feel guilty. So please know that I acknowledge you we moved to Cape Town in 1987 and started as interns, and I became a registrar in anatomical pathology. And about three months into my registrarship, I took a slide to one of the senior registrars, Elaine Neerfeling, and I said to you, Elaine, I don't have a clue what I'm looking at. And she looked at the slide and she said, well, actually, neither do I. And she got up. And she took out the textbook and she said, why don't we discover what it is together? Peer learning at its best. 